Welcome to another episode of Grace Under Pressure. Today, my guest is uh, a friend and colleague and one from whom I've learned a great deal, uh, Dory Clark. I'll tell you about Dory in just a minute. Grace Under Pressure, those of you who have been watching the show for a while know, it were, it's an interview show. We pose questions to thought leaders and doers whose ideas and actions are helping us come to a better understanding of ourselves and the opportunities that await us. Grace Under Pressure reveals what's too often dismissed as the soft stuff. You know, the caring, connecting, commitment we feel toward others. Grace for me is generosity we show, respect we give, compassion we demonstrate. Doing it as a leader, especially in challenging times, requires the ability to act for others and energize everyone around us. And it is my pleasure to welcome Dory Clark. Welcome, Dory. Thank you so much. Great to be here, John. Great. I want to tell everybody a little bit about you. Uh, in your bio, I love this line. So Dory helps individuals and companies get their best ideas heard in a crowded and noisy world. Uh, it used to be noisy, <laughs> but it still works. You are a top 50 uh, business thinker by uh, name by business uh, uh, thinkers 50. Uh, you are also the number one communication in the world, uh, coach in the world. And you're a member of, uh, that was a Marshall Goldsmith Coaching Award. And you're also a member of, uh, of Marshall Goldsmith's uh, 100 Coaches. So Along with you, my man. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, you're a frequent keynote speaker, or at least you used to be, <laughs> but I know you do a lot virtually. Uh, you teach at uh, Fuqua School of Business at Duke and also Columbia Business School. You've had uh, multiple bestsellers. Uh, entrepreneur, you're the author of Entrepreneurial You, which was named one of Forbes' best top five business books of the year, folks. That's a big deal. Um, and also Reinventing You and Stand Out, which was another one, another number one leadership of, of book of the year. And that was by Inc. Magazine. Uh, you've also uh, represented uh, presidential campaigns as a spokesperson. And you've been described by the New York Times as an expert at reinvention and helping others change their lives. Boy, do we need that now. <laughs> so, Dory, welcome. Thank and, you so uh, much. It's a pleasure. So, our world is turned upside down. So what do we do about reinventing ourselves? What What is our entrepreneurial spirit like right now? It's a, it's a very fine question. And I think all of us are are trying to, uh, to, to grapple with it in our own way. I think it's interesting because, of course, people had these hypotheses about what, uh, what they were going to spend their pandemic doing. I think this is, of course, when we thought the pandemic would be two or three weeks. And so uh, there, there were all kinds of predictions, you know, everybody's chest thumping about, oh, I'm going to learn Italian and things like that, uh, which, which seems to have, I think, largely retreated. Uh, it is often parents who are just trying to keep their heads above water, uh, managing their kids. And many people in many industries, uh, including clients that I advise, who have realized that uh, they are busier than ever because they had to shift their business model so abruptly and figure out how to, how to do that and how to make changes and adapt so that they can be successful. So I think that uh, part, part, of, uh, part of the grace of all of this, which I know is, uh, is something that, that you think about a lot, is being gentle with ourselves because I, I think that there is so often uh, a feeling of competitive pressure around some of these things that if you see someone who has been remarkably productive during COVID and, you know, I don't have kids, so I'm probably, you know, statistically more productive than people who are having to homeschool. Uh, sometimes people get upset and say, well, oh, you know, this is terrible. I'm falling behind. But, you know, the, tr the truth is, we are all doing everything on our own timelines, and there are uh, there are waves in terms of how we need to think about our careers and all our lives and what we're focusing on. And uh, I think it's it's understanding where where we fit in that so that we can have realistic expectations. Dory, I'm so glad you talked about that because you know I know in our group in the Marshall Goldsmith 100, and we share a lot of stories when we speak regularly with one another. And some of our folks, uh, some of our fellow members, were with the attitude was uh, what pandemic? <laughs> I'm just, you know, full speed ahead more than ever. Others uh, just needed to say, hey, I need to process this. I need to digest this. And I think what I hear from you is there's permission to do that. Am I correct? So. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, you know, 
hopefully, <laughs> hopefully this won't last forever. Uh, people, uh, people seem to think that, you know, is it a year? Or is it two years? Who, who knows? I mean, it is horrible and painful in the moment, but eventually uh, there will be a vaccine or, you know, at a minimum, there will be herd immunity of some sort right. and we can, we can move on. Uh, but during that time, we, we all be, need to be asking ourselves, what are we over-indexing on and what are we under-indexing on? And just make conscious choices about that. I mean, you if, for all of us, because of regulations and things like that, we are pretty much, uh, as a culture, under-indexing on inter interactions in person with friends and things like that. That is something that I, I certainly know the minute I'm able to do that safely, I am going to want to tip the balance. I'm going to, I'm going to want to visit all my friends. I'm going to want to travel and hang out with people and reintroduce that part of my life. And so because that part has been stripped away, what I am trying to do in terms of the spirit of making the best of it is to say, okay, I'm going to focus on work during this time so that I have the ability and the freedom to focus on it less later on. Uh, it's actually my pandemic coping strategy that if I feel like I am I am working on my book, then actually it feels more like I am choosing to not see people rather than I am not allowed to see people. Right. Well, you are such an expert at networking and but savvy networking doing it purposefully doing it in ways that enrich your career but also this sense of joy and sharing in that because i know from people who are connected to you that that's one of your key attributes you make everybody you you're an expert uh, you you would be a wonderful um uh, host for a salon in the 18th century. <laughs> so, That's very uh, kind. Yeah. Um, but how do, um, so what's the value of networking now in our totally digital world? Well, I, I think there's uh, there's a few things that are important. And our fellow MG100 friend, uh, Alyssa Cohn, and I actually have written a pair of articles for the Harvard Business Review about this uh, in terms of networking in a digital or virtual environment. Um, the first part is that of course, it is important to stay top of mind with people that are existing connections. Um, you know, we're, we might normally run into them in the street or at the office or we'd, you know, we'd be getting coffee. Um, we are not doing those things now. And so you do need a way to stay in light touch with people. This is how networking works, right? Is you can't assume that whatever you're selling, that people need to buy it constantly. Uh, typically that's not the case, but if you stay in light touch or your top of mind for when somebody actually does need to buy something or when they hear somebody say, Oh, you know, I, I wish wish someone could recommend a person who's great at X. Well, you, you want to be on the front burner so that they say that. So the value of networking is that you are able to be top of mind with, and keep the connections warm with your existing contacts. But also, I think an important thing that we can't forget, especially as the pandemic turns out to be longer than we thought, is that we can't just give up on meeting new people. Uh, it's not the time to hunker down and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm done. I now know every human being that I'm ever going to, to know. Uh, it is important and valuable to keep expanding our social networks. And so thinking of ways to do that, I mean, for instance, I've uh, periodically done some virtual cocktails and things like that uh, can, can be a valuable way to, to approach that situation. You mentioned something which is another um, what, when you're well known for. It's having that identity. Another word for that is brand. So what role is brand playing with an individual when we're all separate? So. Yeah, very, a very good question. Um, when it comes to your brand, I mean, ultimately, because we do, you know, you're you're joking about this. It's true. Uh, the world is a lot less noisy than it was, at least in terms of, uh, you know, let's say traffic noise, because <laughs> people people are not uh, really moving around so much. But uh, but actually, conversely, digitally, there's probably more noise than ever, since everyone has suddenly got it in their heads. Oh, I guess I should be on LinkedIn now. I guess I should be doing <laughs> webinars. Or, or, you know, so suddenly it's a great idea. Um, so there's there's so much in that vein. And so the question is, well, how do you stand out? How do you uh, get people to pay attention? And, you know, the people who know you already will pay attention because, you know, oh, well, I'm John's friend. Let's see what John's doing. But for people who don't know you, it, it's a it's a higher bar. It's a little bit more of a, a hurdle to clear. And so what we uh, can accomplish with our brand 
is that ultimately, uh, if we have been slowly and steadily investing in our brand, meaning creating content, sharing ideas, uh, putting things out there, you become known for uh, for things. Your name becomes familiar to people, and it makes it more likely that they are willing to listen to what you say and to trust those things once you say them. And that is a very powerful advantage in our society. I, I'm uh, brand. I think from a leadership standpoint, I, I the marketing and. Um, aspect of it. I always like to, I come out of a marketing communications background from many years ago. And the idea of who owns your brand, it's your customers, of course. Um, so from a leadership standpoint, who owns your brand, Dory? Yeah, that's, that's really, that's really interesting. I mean, in terms of uh, when, just to make sure I understand, John, uh, when you say from a leadership perspective, who owns your brand? Can you uh, expound your, just a little bit? Your perceptions of others. So what others perceive you to be. And yes, good, good question. So I think one thing that's important to keep in mind in terms of the, uh, the contemporary way that, that we need to think about branding these days is that your brand really operates on two tracks, right? There is the track that has always been the case, which is that peop the people around you, the people that you interact with, think something about you. And therefore, you have uh, this kind of local brand, right? Your, your co-workers, oh, well, you know, John's a really inclusive leader. Or, you know, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, oh, that John, he's such an autocrat. He never, uh, he never listens, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they think something. Uh, that has always been the case as long as humans have existed. But now we have a secondary track. And it's actually you know, I say secondary, it's actually probably becoming primary uh, now that so many interactions are taking place online. And that is what I will call your global brand, your brand as you present it to people that don't know you personally or have not necessarily worked with you one-on-one. -on -one. It right. is what is the impression that people already have of you or are deriving of you based on uh, digital interactions or based on things that they've read about you in your LinkedIn profile or when you when they Google you or things like that. And it's important. You have to manage both because both of those things really are shaping the way people think about you. You know, I'm glad you're mentioning this, things like that uh, you and I may and most of our colleagues take for granted, like a LinkedIn profile or whatever. Um, and I, I, the pushback, and I know you hear it too, is do I really need to do this? So tell me why I need to do this, uh, Dory. <laughs> well, specifically for a LinkedIn profile, uh, first of all, I feel like it's it's a little bit of a no-brainer just because it, it doesn't honestly take that much time to create a basic profile, right? You invest 60 minutes, 90 minutes, and then you have this nice thing. Um, but above and beyond, uh, so, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's sort of like the question of like, um, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, the, uh, the the question of uh, Pascal's wager, right? Like, well, why wouldn't you believe in God? <laughs> if right. It doesn't cost you that much, or you go to hell. Okay, right? <laughs> it's uh, sort of sort of the same thing for a LinkedIn profile. Why wouldn't you spend ninety minutes creating a LinkedIn profile? Um, but the basic idea is, first of all. It is really, honestly, unless you have your own website, which many people do not, uh, it is pretty much the only place online where you get to control exactly what it says about you. How fantastic is that? You know, in Google, you know, you, you type in your name into Google and it could be all of these completely random things. You know, it creates this disjointed uh, perception of who you are, but your LinkedIn profile, you have come up with every single word on there. If you don't like it, that's that's on you. You can make it be what you want it to be. And that's, that's very powerful. And it has the advantage that it also ranks very highly in search results. So if you, uh, assuming you don't have like the world's most common name and you, know, you get confused with other people, um, if you type your name into Google and you, you do have a LinkedIn profile, odds are that is one of the very first things that people will see. So if you have this magic combination of a place online where you can control what it says, and it is going to be one of the very first things that people say about see about you, why would you not take the 60 to 90 minutes to, uh, to do that? Absolutely. Integral to brand um, is, is your identity, of course, but it has to be rooted in something we call authenticity. What is the role of authenticity in one's brand? So, so authenticity in your brand is, uh, is an interesting question. I mean, 
uh, the the term authenticity, of course, gets uh, gets thrown around probably too much these days. It's become it's become this little buzzword uh, that that when overused gets stripped of meaning. But the concept behind it, I think, is uh, is still quite powerful. Which is number one at the most basic level, you can't have a brand that is somehow fundamentally at odds with uh, with who you actually are or, or your way of being in the world because it will very quickly be discovered. And one of the worst things that, that one can be labeled in our society is a hypocrite or someone who is covering things up or trying, trying to hide things. So you, you don't wanna create those conditions. There needs to be congruity between uh, the being and the seeming. That's, that's number one. But number two, uh, I think there is another point that needs to be made, which is that so often there's a little bit of what I will call a, a, a homogenizing impulse that people feel where they feel like, oh, you know, I need to look professional. I need to do it this way because everybody does it this way. And the truth is it, it will succeed in making you look like everyone else, but that's also the downside. It will make you look like everyone else. And then you're indistinguishable. And then there's not really a good reason for people to be choosing you as compared to uh, whoever the low priced option is. So it doesn't really get you anything. Um, where you get a lot more traction is if you are able to contribute something actually new to the dialogue. Right. Which raises the topic of, and this is your sweet spot because you are uh, a world expert in communications and leadership communications. What kind of messages are resonating in our today's world. So. Well, I, th I think that for a lot of, for a lot of things, um, you know, this, this uh, right at the moment has been a rather unprecedented set of events that are, that are all happening at the same time. And so what we, what we always need to do is to make sure that whatever we're talking about somehow has a way in to connect with what people are, are seeing and feeling and experiencing at the moment. And you know you could have the world's best content, but if it's not, if it doesn't feel relevant to people, um, it's just not going to go very far. It's it doesn't have any chance of virality because why would somebody share it if it's not relevant? And it is, uh, you know, people just say, oh, that's nice, but it sits on a shelf. I mean, I'll give you an example. It was certainly not irrelevant when I submitted it, but uh, I wrote a piece in February which I submitted to the Harvard Business Review about how to build connections with uh, with other people if you were joining a professional group and you don't know ever anybody but they all seem to know each other right and uh, you know I feel like it's kind of an interesting topic there's plenty of people who have had that experience that they join professional groups and then oh my god it's kind of a click what do you do um, I think it's a good topic but by the time the editor got around to looking at it it was March and it was no longer relevant you know nobody nobody cared like that's joining a professional group and whether or not you feel like you fit in that's that's lovely for when times are good but if if everybody that you know is is getting laid off and might get sick with some mystery serious illness that's that's not what you care about and so the the piece has just been kind of mothballed like it'll you know it'll run someday uh but it's just not the thing that people care about so i think that relevancy is really the first screen that we we need to look at I'm someone, and I'm pretty sure you do too, that believes that crisis provokes opportunity. So why is this good time to be an entrepreneur or entrepreneurial? So, Yeah, it is certainly a, a good time to be entrepreneur. You see, I mean, opportunity is ringing right now for you, John. It's because nice like, I forgot yeah. to unplug my phone. So. <laughs> it's opportunity, John. Yeah. Are you there? <laughs> I'm a call from China. So... <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, well, so the reason that opportunity is, uh, is, is there inherent in, in crisis and change is that most people don't necessarily proactively want to change the way that they do things. And, you know, which is, which is not, you know, I think it's very easy. Oh, people don't like change. But it's, it's really like, well, why would you? If something is working, like we, we have enough cognitive load anyway. So why would we complicate things for ourselves? I will give you an example. For nearly the past five years, almost every day, I have gone to a coffee shop whose coffee I like very much. And they are a block away from my house or block and a half. And, you know, they're great. And I enjoy the coffee. I enjoy the experience. 
why would I change? Uh, but with a pandemic, the shop closed and it was no longer an option. And so I had to find something else. And there was another coffee shop nearby that I had, I had tried it, you know, once or twice. I was like, well, it's, you know, it's okay. It's fine. But it was, you know, it was always crowded, you know, so I, I never, I never really focused in on it. But these guys, unlike my coffee shop, these guys stayed open for the entirety of the pandemic. And so I could go there and, you know, it's like uh, frightening times in the early April, but they would still serve me coffee. And so I became a fan and a patron of them. And I never would have otherwise. So crisis upends routine. And it's in those moments that you have the opportunity to insert yourself and become a new part of someone's routine. Great. Cream rises to the top and hot coffee. Uh, and speaking of our coffee metaphor. So how does adversity provoke people to make a mark in, uh, in what they do, either as an entrepreneur or being entrepreneurial in their own company? So. Yeah, also an interesting question. I think that where adversity comes in, I mean, ev everything's higher stakes, right? And so, so the, I guess the good the good part of leading in adversity is, um, first of all, if things go badly, it is true that you might be blamed, but also there's um, there's no counterfactual. And so many people will sort of be gentle anyway, because they'll be like, well, it's, the situation was so messed up to begin with, you know, he did what he could. <laughs> so, uh, so it's high risk, but also you may, you may get a pass uh, because people may say, well, you know, we, uh, it, it may, it might, it might've been even worse if he weren't leading, but also on the converse, if you actually do a stellar job, leading people through a terrible crisis. Um, the bar is so low. People are like, oh, things are miserable. Things are horrible, blah, blah. And then you exceed expectations and people say, that is a leader. Wow. And you are able to make a mark disproportionately. I mean, if we think, of course, in American history of presidents um, who are, have been the most memorable, they are usually the presidents who have led during uh, stressful and tumultuous times because we are, we are so disproportionately grateful that they were able to steer us through those shoals. That's a good point. Um, you have brought a book along and I've asked you to read a favorite passage passage. So would you tell us what it is and do a little reading, please? So. Hi, I certainly can. Thank you, John. I brought along my, actually my second book. It's called Stand Out. Let's see if I can get it here. For, yay. Uh, and Stand Out in many ways is kind of sort of my, my clarion call about how to become a recognized expert in your company or in your field. And so I would be happy to, uh, to read a little excerpt if that would be desirable. Absolutely, please. All right, here we go. So here's a dramatic rendition, people. <laughs> All right, Stand Out by yeah. Dory Clark. <laughs> you have something to say to the world. You have a contribution to make. Each of us has ideas that can reshape the world in large ways or small. It might be developing a new business process, creating a new literary movement, or finding a new way to deliver humanitarian aid. It could be changing how the world looks at a political cause or how students are taught or how the corporate world should handle work-life balance. Whatever your issue, if you really want to make an impact, it's important for your voice to be heard. Yet too many of us shrink back when it comes to finding and sharing our ideas with the world. We assume the leading experts must have some unique talent or insight. We assume that our own ideas may not measure up. We assume that working hard and keeping our heads down will be enough to move our careers forward. But none of those things is true. Most recognized experts achieved success not because of some special genius, but because they learned how to put disparate elements together and present ideas in a new and meaningful way. That's a skill anyone with hard work can practice and learn. And more and more, it's essential. In today's competitive economy, it's not enough to simply do your job well. Developing a reputation as an expert in your field attracts people who wanna hire you, do business with you and your company, and spread your ideas. It is the ultimate form of career insurance.
That's great. I love it. And uh, it's such word, encouraging words, challenging words for all of us. And so um, uh, because now is our opportunity, you know, uh, everything's uh, uncertain. So why not be certain about yourself? Would you not agree with that, Dory? Yes. Absolutely. Control what you can control. That's the that's the mantra, John. You got it. I want to switch a little bit to a theme. Um, grace which is a catalyst for the greater good. Would you like to share an example of grace in your life or that you, that you recognize? So, Well, I think one of, one of the nicest forms of grace is where <laughs> you've, you've screwed up and someone else uh, is, is very uh, kind about it. And so one, uh, one form of what you might call grace uh, that I thought of when you asked the question was actually going, going back now nearly 20 years early in my career, I was the press secretary on the governor's campaign for former U.S. Labor Secretary Robert Reich. And uh, there was uh, there was a, a campaign situation which was <laughs> I mean it was it was all kind of bonkers to begin with, but there was this uh, this campaign situation where we had as a campaign. I, so I was the press secretary. I had nothing to do with this piece, but uh, the campaign had bought a camper. It was like this kind of RV, uh, very trendy now in COVID. Uh, yeah. But we had this RV. <laughs> And we were, tr and so we used it. We called it the Reich Reform Express, and we we uh, went all across Massachusetts on this camper, so that uh, so that the candidate could could meet meet the voters. Sure. And so anyway, it was discovered. It turns out, uh, you know, it's hard hardcore opposition research here, uh, focusing on the real issues. It was discovered that the camper was not properly registered when we bought it. It was like, oh, you know, the, the registration was wrong or somebody didn't do the registration. And so the uh, the reporter um, for for one of these papers uh, kept, you know, trying to like bait me into making a comment about it. And he, he wouldn't tell me what it was and blah, 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 blah. blah. And anyway... I ended up, uh, I ended up making like just sort of a dumb comment and it was, it was just, it was like not a great pull quote. It wasn't horrible, but it was kind of a dumb comment. And so they, they blew it up into this like 70 point font and they put it in the paper the next day. And I went in the next day to talk to Robert Reich and to, to say, um, look, did you see the paper? <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, it was very, it was very embarrassing. And, uh, because, you know, I knew that I screwed up. He knew that I screwed up and he just took the paper and he looked at it and he just kind of laughed and he's like, eh, you know, what, what can you do? Yeah. So he, uh, he was very kind. That is indeed grace. And, um, there is some grace is that catalyst for the greater good. And sometimes it is a huge, great goodness. You talked about humanitarian efforts and those are things. But so often, grace is just the tiny moments um, when someone basically cuts us a break, you know, or from our standpoint, we cut them a break, you know, and that's that's what makes the world go round. Um, Dora, you're a terrific guest. How can people find you? So. Thank you very much, uh, John. I appreciate it. What a, what a treat to get to spend time with you. So the best way that they can get in touch uh, with me and uh, find out a little bit more if they'd like is to go to doryclark.com. And if, uh, oh my goodness, I have a I have a kitten incursion here. Wow. We'll, we'll see. It. It's, it's the real you, Dory. <laughs> yes, yes. You might, you might see a little ear. Yeah, okay, That's Philip. Right. Yeah, maybe, maybe later, <laughs> Phil. <laughs> so if you'd like to get in touch with me or Phil, up, uh, go to doryclark.com slash subscribe, and you can actually get my uh, my newsletter. We can stay in touch. Uh, Forbes has called my newsletter, uh, I forget what it was. It was something very complimentary. I think they said it was inspiring. So uh, so you can check it out, uh, check it out there and, and be in touch, and uh, I'll even share cat anecdotes as well. That's great. And Dory, I know you write for the Harvard Business Review, so uh, as in other places, and you're all over, you're doing interviews and podcasts and all of that, all those good things. So if anyone would simply Google your name, they'll find an ocean of resources on you, and you're, of course, on LinkedIn. So you have been a wonderful guest, and um, stay tuned for more episodes of Grace Under Pressure. And it has been my honor to host you today, and thank you for your generosity 
and your grace with us today. So.